So now in this last look at human gastrulation, we'll entitle the next flowchart Human Gastrulation 3. What we want to look at are the sort of side results of gastrulation. There are going to be more things that happen uh, besides the fact that we have those three germ layers. So what we're going to initially establish is exactly what I just said, that gastrula, as a result of gastrulation, is going to be a structure that forms. Gastrula forms um, and it develops, so plus develops, those three primary embryonic germ layers. And those were, of course, the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm, mesoderm, whatever you want to call it. Okay, and then we know the origins of each as a result of the events that we saw in the previous flowchart. But now there's also going to be some other stuff that develops as a sort of side event to this gastrulation and gastrula development. So let's take a look. So we'll state also there's going to be structures or the gastrulation will involve and be with extra embryonic membranes. That's what they're called. So we're also going to develop extra embryonic membranes. Extra means outside. So these are going to be membranes surrounding this developing embryo. Therefore, we first have to state that this is actually, these membranes will not be a part of the actual embryo. So they're not part of actual embryo but still absolutely critical for embryo success. Um, and because they're not part of the actual embryo, they will actually be discarded at birth. Okay, Usually right after birth or with birth, they're going to be discarded from the female. So what are these extra embryonic membranes? What are these extra things that are being formed? Um, and why are they being formed is another big question that we'll answer here. So the extra embryonic membranes consist of uh, a couple of ones that you need to remember. There's a chorion membrane. The chorion membrane is formed directly from the trophoblast. So the trophoblast, you could say that exterior, the outer layer of cells that surrounds the uh, blastocyst, it matures and develops further into something known as the chorion. Um, and this is going to be something that will surround the embryo and all other embryo, uh, uh, the embryo and all other membranes because it's the outermost and therefore of course if it's the outermost it will surround everything within it and all other membranes will be surrounded by it in addition to the embryo so the chorion is that first sort of extra embryonic layer to focus on in addition another important extra embryonic layer is the amnion this is also going to be formed from the trophoblast but it's a little bit more interior than the chorion this is formed from trophy, trophoblast for short, and what we're stating here is that this is going to be a structure that encloses the embryo specifically. It encloses the embryo in what is known as amniotic fluid. The embryo is therefore constantly going to be within a very aqueous environment, and this is going to be a big, big evolutionary outcome or circumstance that we talked a lot about when we talked about animal development and the movement onto land that I'll talk about uh, in just a second for when we talk about the purpose of all this. We're just covering what's there for right now. So we have a chorion in amnion. We also have a yolk sac. The yolk sac is going to be a membrane that eventually forms many blood cells. Membrane that forms blood cells. Those are going to be useful in the overall development of this organism, the human. And there's also going to be one more to note that's called the allantois. The allantois uh, is going to be a structure, an extra embryonic membrane that's directly incorporated, incorporated into the umbilical cord more on the umbilical cord later in terms of what its purpose is and what we're going to utilize it for. Um, overall, the allantois, because it forms and is incorporated into a point of exchange, the umbilical cord, the purpose of it is to form blood vessels that are necessary for umbilical cord function, as we'll see later. So those are our extra embryonic layers. Be aware of them and understand their origins. Now, 
something I like to talk about. Why are things happening the way that they are? So let's look at the extra um, embryonic membrane purpose. Okay, extra embryonic membrane purpose. There must be an evolutionary drive to this. Why is this happening? Well, what we want to notice is that in mammals, and even reptiles, I'll say, in mammals and even comma reptiles, you notice that, first of all, these are going to be only within these structures, with all, only within these organisms. Extra embryonic membranes are in mammals and are in reptiles. They are not in other organisms like fish or amphibians. Not fish slash amphibians. Why is that? Well, what happens is the fish and amphibians live in water. Okay, that's not news to anybody. They live in water. It's their environment, and that's where they are going to have reproduction and birth and everything and development, whatever it may be. And their major concern is drying out. They are concerned about drying out. That's their major concern. And we do not have that concern. We don't care because we are land-dwelling organisms. But for the purposes of development, specifically embryonic development, we really care about the fact that, or what's, I would say we are even jealous of the fact that fish and amphibians live in water directly and can develop their embryonic, let's say, stages directly within that fluid environment. So what we have to do is make up for our loss. We've invested so much time and resource to being on land and being successful on land, but we're still going to be reliant on this fluid history that we had, this water history that we had. So in order to sort of pay homage and respect to this origin that we all had, we're going to notice that extra embryonic membranes are going to be vital in animals, vital in all animals, in animals that don't live in water that don't live in aqueous environment, I should say. Live in aqueous ENV environment. So this is going to be vital, absolutely life harboring and necess it's an absolute necessity for all organisms that don't live in water. Um, this is because you constantly have to surround the embryo with fluid. That's a requirement of embryonic development. It has to happen. And so what do we do? We utilize amniotic fluid. How do we utilize amniotic fluid? Well, we develop an extra embryonic, embryonic layer called the amnion, which encloses the embryo in amniotic fluid, as we said. Therefore, this results in the evolution of amniotes. Remember those? Big group of organisms, very advanced, very specialized land-dwelling organisms. Take a look at figure 47.12 to really drive home this point of the extra embryonic membrane purpose. Again, the point of this is that during gastrulation, yes, you get endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm, but we as humans are complex organisms. Um, mammals are complex, reptiles are relatively complex, and thus we get more complexities that follow with our complex development, as you can see here with the chorion, amnion, yolk sac, allantois, you get the deal. And that covers our look at human gastrulation. Now what we're going to do is round out this lecture and sort of come to a peak. Remember what we said? We wanted to go from a blastula, blastocyst in the human case, um, all the way to a living and born organism. Let's do that now with embryonic development.